Good morning. Friends, welcome to the worship of God at Wallingford Presbyterian Church. We're very glad that you are here. Uh, this will make a little sense uh, when, hey, it's, there's never a bad day to wear your kilt, is there? No, no of course not. But anyways, um, we're very glad that you're here. A couple of announcements. Just a reminder to parents that we do have our uh, disciples, young disciples room that will be open uh, after the, uh, the children's time. So... Uh, the children are welcome to stay in worship. If you want them, there's a, a video series that, that will, they'll be showing the kids, so that's also open for you. You may have noticed in the back of the chair, in the back of the sanctuary, though no one is sitting there, um, that there are four uh, new chairs that have not been there previously. Uh, when you make your way to coffee hour, you'll see 100 chairs uh, in the fellowship hall. You might remember... Um, that about a year ago uh, or more, uh, this church started on an intentional outreach uh, to uh, people of all abilities. And one of the things that we realized when we had individuals who would come here um, in wheelchairs and stuff that pews are not necessarily the most conducive uh, and inviting uh, for people of all abilities, especially people with mobility issues, pushing themselves up from the pew, etc. So um, the session uh, has decided, or decided about a year and a half ago, or two years, it's hard for me to keep track of time anymore, that we would put in various places around the church um, chairs. Uh, so we'll be taking out some pews in the next uh, couple of weeks so that they'll be in place by rally day. And there'll be certain sections in uh, the sanctuary where there will be chairs and certain sections interspersed where there will be pews. So you pew huggers, don't fret. There will be a pew here. It may not be your pew, <laughs> but there will be a pew uh, in various places throughout, throughout the congregation. So we really are striving to make this building, this sanctuary, this place of welcome, uh, a place of welcome. And you know, it's very hard to retrofit uh, modern sorts of things in, in old buildings such as this. So be patient, be understanding, be loving as you all are, and try it out. Uh, they're actually very comfortable. Uh, so they're in the back. Those four will be there until we're ready to, uh, to put them in different places um, throughout the church. Any questions about that? All right. I think that's all that I have to say other than towards the center aisle of each pew, our Black Friendship pew pads. You're invited to uh, find those, to fill out the information that's there, to share it with other people who are uh, sitting with you in your pew. And I think with that, Shirley, if you would, please lead us in our call to worship. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let us worship God.
Friends, please be seated and I'll invite our children to come forward at this time and join me at the steps of the chancel. So today, I wanted to talk to you about being different. Do I look a little different to you today than I normally do? Right? I'm wearing my kilt. Actually, it's a new kilt. This tartan is the US Navy tartan. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. But I wanted to wear it today because I wanted to talk about what it means sometimes to be different. And I also brought my favorite little different... Oops, lost a feather. Because she reminds me, and I had a friend who gave her to me, oh, about 40 years ago, that being different doesn't mean being anything other than different. So I want to tell you a little story. When I was nine years old, I came to this country and I didn't speak a word of English. And back then, they didn't really have all those special classes and stuff. I mean, they had some. But they basically said, oh good, you're in fourth grade, have fun. <laughs> and they put me in a fourth grade class and I didn't understand what people were saying. I didn't understand what the teacher was saying. I wasn't sure. I sort of picked up by, you know, signs and uh, uh, people sort of showing me what I needed to do. And I, little by little, I started to learn English. They did put me in a special class, and I started with C spot, C spot run, C Jill, Jill runs after spot, all of that stuff. But, but, there was a little girl in my class by the name of Linda Heyman, I still remember her name, who was from Morocco, and she spoke French and English. And she spent the better part of three or four months sitting with me and translating for me so that I could understand what was taking place and so that I could become the person that I am. So I wanted you to, to say two things to you. One, being different is okay, and you're gonna run into people who don't talk like you, who don't look like you, who are from different countries, who, and so that's just a part of life. But what the real example here is the example that Linda set, right? And how can you be the Lindas in people's lives? How can you be that person who says, I can help out, I can do this, I can help this person out, all right? So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> You're all a bunch of great lasses and lads, Hi. <laughs> all right, Pastor Taylor, you gonna close us in prayer? Yes, let's do, how about we do an echo prayer? Would that be good? I'll say it, and you'll say it after us, and then our congregation will help, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making us different. Thank you for making us different. Help us to celebrate and help each other. In Jesus' name, amen. You and all. now I think if you turn in your bulletins. Oh yes, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Okay? So often um, we pray after you guys have gone to Sunday school. We do a long prayer for other people. That's called the prayer of intercession. Can you say that? Intercession. Yeah. Well, we're going to do a prayer for you guys, so you don't have to say anything, okay? But all of your church family is going to pray for you before you go, okay? So you guys can close your eyes, or you, you can even look out at your church family. But church family, we're going to pray for the children now. It's in your bulletin, so let us go before God in prayer. 
God of heaven and earth, we pray for the children of our church. We know that they are your beloved children and that you love them. We ask your hand of blessing be over each one of these children gathered here today and those who are not here. We ask that your Holy Spirit would rest on each of them and you guard, protect, guide, and nurture each one of them by your power and grace. We thank you for the light they bring to us through their smiles, laughter, and unique characteristics. Bless their comings and goings and help them to always know your love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. You did so great. So now you can either go to the toddler room downstairs or the video room upstairs, okay? It's your choice and you can go with your teachers, please. Thank you so much. You did so great. The future of our church. <laughs> Join me in the prayer of confession. Our confession this morning will be times of meditation and silence as we bring before God our shortcomings. Holy God, we come before you to honestly confess our wrongdoings. We take a moment to call to mind all the times we have hurt others this week in word, thought, or deed. We call to mind the times when we put our own desires and needs before the needs of others. We call to mind the times we judged others too quickly, gossiped, name called, or spoken a harsh word out of anger. We call to mind the times we built up our own ego, tried to impress others, forced our own way, or made jokes at the expense of others to get a cheap laugh.
We call to mind the times we ignored the plight of the needy and shut our ears to the cries of those who need our time and resources. We see that our sins are many. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to see each of our sins clearly so we can turn, repent, and be made new. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, and Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks Thanks be to God. Testament reading today comes from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Hear now the word of the Lord. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses seven through 10. This is right after the parable of the mustard seed. And immediately after that, Jesus says, actually, before he says the parable of the mustard seed, the whole thing that starts this is, Lord, add faith to us, increase our faith. So he talks about the mustard seed. Then he says this, to put it in context. Who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending the sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, later you may eat and drink? 
Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So this little parable, if you could call it that, is very upsetting to me. It might be to you too. You know, how could he say this about us? Doesn't it feel at least a little bit like a betrayal? We sing, and I teach Jesus loves me to our children. We sing it our whole lives long. And then we get this, and this is how we're viewed like slaves. Not just that, but then we're asked or commanded to be more than happy doing it. This doesn't feel like a loving story. To me, I read it, and it has echoes of those other ancient Near Eastern religions that existed at the time of Jesus and the Old Testament, which subscribed to the belief that people were only made so that they could serve the gods, like Baal, who was mentioned a lot in the Old Testament, and many other gods at the time. Baal and others only wanted to recline in the heavens, and so they made humans to serve them. But that's not the kind of God I want to serve. One that's so selfish and lazy that he has to make slaves do everything for him? That's not right. And so I really wrestle with this text because it smacks of that exact kind of thing. If Jesus really said this, I want to look at him and say, why would you treat me this way? Don't you love me like the song says? Please don't be like them. Please treat me like a human. And I'm writing this and I'm thinking, I think I'm hurt by this. Give me a break. I can't imagine the pain and hurt that the black community has when they must see a text like this. The heartbreak, the history, none of which I can speak to with any authority other than to say I can't imagine. And surely all of us want an answer to this. Why? Why would Jesus tell us this? If you're not like Baal and those other gods, then why would you say this to us, Jesus? Let's look at this together. Stay with me. First, is he like Baal? No, because he did, Jesus did two things that they would never do. So what did he do? One, he came down to be like one of us. And so to redeem all parts of us, all parts of our life, all parts of our personhood. Then he made the ultimate sacrifice of dying on a cross for us so that we could, I mean, this list could go on forever, be united with him, be saved from the penalty of sin, seated in the heavenly places, and offered the promise of heaven. So much more than that, but that's the tip of the iceberg. None of that is anything of what these other so-called gods offered. Moreover, what Jesus did by dying for us is light years more than what he ever asked for us in this text, right? Yes, he's asking for our servanthood, our sacrifice, our contentment in those roles, but not without doing even more of those things for us. So the sacrifice is reciprocal. And in fact, that's a little bit of an insult to Jesus to say it was reciprocal. He did all the heavy lifting. Second, I think he said this. So we're going back to why. First, he's not like the other gods. Second, why? Why, why, why? I think he said this because of our own inclination to want to serve our own ego. Let's be real. This is why I did a long confession today. Since the first pages of the Bible, we have wanted to be like God. Our pride tells us that we deserve so much that we should be able to be like God. 
Look how science even is trying to push us so far that we are like our own little gods, making artificial womb facilities, growing food in labs, making more and more robots and technology to serve us. We want to grab that fruit from the tree and be like God. We say, why should I have to be like a human? I want to be like you, God. But this text, what Jesus is telling us today, it sounds harsh, but I have to believe he's saying, know my beloved child for your own good. I want you to remember that you are not like me. You're not a God. You are a human. You are a servant. So animal trainers will often say that dogs, see my dog's out of, I have two dogs and they're out of control. Yip, 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 bark, 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 you know, call on everybody who comes in the house. They don't bite, but they're out of control. So I wish someone had trained these dogs. But here we go. Animal trainers will often say that dogs and other domesticated animals will test boundaries, right? They try to see, anybody with a dog will probably testify to this. They try to see if they can be the alpha. They try to see if they can run the household, right? or be the master. But that animal doesn't know that what they actually need is to be in their place as a pack member in order to be happy. If they were the master, they would not have the structure that they need to thrive. This is what all the trainers say. And I hate to compare us to animals, so forgive me for that. But I'm simply saying that I think God wants us to remember our place. When we try to become alpha, run the household, become like little gods. It's not good for us. We weren't made for that. And we won't have the structure we need to thrive. Instead, we should be content serving God as who we are and not be reaching. In the passage that Shirley read today, from Lamentations, we hear, the Lord is my portion. I think this fits beautifully because instead of saying power is my portion, we can say the Lord is my portion. And that is the thing that will actually bring us the most joy. Though Jesus' words are harsh, they are, but they're actually loving because this is for our own good. And the third thing I want to say before I let you go is just a little twist. I was going to end there, but then I talked to my husband about this, and he said, ah, don't forget this other parable. (laughs) And I said, oh, thank you, dear Lord. I always say God's ministry of near misses, like something was was about to end. We got to add a little piece of sprinkle of good news. Okay, so this is a twist. And to find this twist, we have to back it up. Back it up two chapters prior in Luke. Luke is so good. Just read it straight through. It's so beautiful. Pack it up two chapters, right? And we hear from Jesus, from Jesus' mouth, this story. So, same man. The story that could probably sum up all of the Bible or the good news. The prodigal son. Prodigal son. If you haven't heard it, I think you all have. But just a reminder. There's a younger brother, two brothers. The younger brother asked for his inheritance early before his father died. It's a big smack in the face. But the father gives it to him. He leaves. He squanders it on horrible living. And he ends up being a farmhand, feeding the pigs. And then he starts to make designs to return home and beg his father to just be his slave because even his father's slaves are being treated much better than his situation right now. Because remember, he's a Jew and he's dealing with pigs. So that's, right, okay. So remember, let's go back to our story now. Remember when Jesus tells us in our text to simply be happy as a slave? Well, this son is actually doing that and he's actually begging for it. Here he is, right? Please, Father, let me just be your slave. But... But, 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 what happens? I just have to read it. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
and felt compassion for him. They hadn't even spoken yet. Oh, it just gets me all choked up. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, uh, like I've heard them say, like the father interrupts him, right? He won't even finish his speech. He hasn't gotten to the part where he begs yet. He interrupts him with love. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf, slaughter it. Let's eat, let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. What does this mean? Yes, we should be happy, like Jesus said, to simply be servants. Because that is who we are, and we need that structure. But, and this is a twist, God does not leave it there. He doesn't stop at that. He adds to that. Because of his grace, because of his abounding mercy, he goes beyond that. And suddenly, our slavehood has become sonship. Our servitude has become inheritance. Romans 8 says this more beautifully than I ever could. Paul says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. And when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if we in fact suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So no, he does not see you as a slave. He wants us to be content with our servanthood so that we're not reaching to be like him. But even as we are content, he lifts us up into sonship, which can never be revoked. That's the point of the prodigal son story. It will not go away no matter what we do. So let's go now to the banquet and celebrate. Even while he said in our text that we should be happy to be the ones cooking it, in his infinite mercies, he seats us at the table, having killed his best calf for us for no other reason that Jesus does and always will love you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now, friends, I'm going to take just a moment for a time of silence. We don't often do this, sometimes in our prayer time, but I thought, why not? I read something in a book the other day that said, uh, oh, this is so great, I'm not going to quote it right, Kierkegaard. Somebody asked Kierkegaard one day, and he, they said, what is it to uh, put first the kingdom of God? Is it to get a job in ministry? And he said, No. It's to seek first the kingdom of God. Is it to serve your neighbor? No. It's to seek first the kingdom of God. And he does three or four more things. Is it to give all your money to the poor? No. Seek first the kingdom of God. And the person was confused, and he said, what do you mean? And he says, it means to become nothing before God, to become silent in his presence, and that is the beginning. So we'll just take a moment to become nothing before God. Become silent before God, and that is the beginning. Let us go to God in a time of silence and prayer.
Amen and amen. Got to get my, get my uh, signals here. <laughs> Everything we have is purely a gift from God. Remember that without him, we have no breath and life. Let us acknowledge that our life's purpose and indeed our very life's breath is given by God through his mercy and grace. In humility, let us give to God what is rightfully his. I now invite the ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering.
I invite you to join me in our unison prayer of dedication. Holy Lord, bless these offerings so that they would glorify your work of peace in this world. May they multiply and be fruitful so that your love may spread to all who need it. Thank you for teaching us this practice of giving as it heals our hearts when we truly open them up gently. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a word of explanation, if you would turn in your bulletin to uh, the next hymn, When Hands Reach Out and Fingers Trace, we will be singing the uh, verses of that hymn uh, as part uh, of our intercessory prayers. And I think it will be fairly clear as to when you're called uh, to sing and lead, will lead us in that endeavor. So let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you and we dare to pray, to pray for the world, to pray for our friends, to pray for family, even to pray for ourselves. We pray for loved ones, wherever they may be. We pray for their trials, for their successes. We pray for all of the things that we carry in our hearts for those that we love. was St. Augustine, Lord, who said that when we sing, we pray twice. But as Pastor Taylor invited us today, we also know that silence, that silence is also the sound of prayer. And so at this time, we share our inmost thoughts, those prayers, some of which we only share with you. And we ask you to listen in our silence. Gracious God, we're conscious of those who are in need of prayer in our own community. We're conscious of all that's going on in the world, and we pray especially for those who have lost everything, and most of all, family and friends in the devastating wildfires in Maui and up the West Coast. We're reminded every day of the victims of war, and we pray for them and for a sense of peace in our world. Every day, every day, every day, someone gets shot. 
all around the world and in our own communities in Philadelphia. We remember the men, women, and all the veterans of our armed forces, our seminarian, Adrian, our missionaries, Jenny, and Melissa, and John, and keep them in heart and prayer as well. Gracious God, there's just so much division in our world, so people who won't talk to each other anymore, even in our own families. We can't sit at the same table. We can't talk about certain things because if we do, we know that someone will stand and leave, whether physically or just in their heart or in their mind. There's so much need for a sense of harmony and peace and that holy word, shalom, that all-comprehensive peace in heart and mind and spirit. We long for it. We pray for it. We beg for it. Hear us, O God. Gracious God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, this congregation, that we might find a sense of wholeness and peace that we can share with our community, with, with our state, with our nation, with our world. Let us be the light in the darkness. Let us show others how to love, what it means to love one another. Let us set the example. We pray for your church, O oh God, and for this congregation. Lead us by your spirit of wholeness. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray using the words our Savior gave us to pray. And let us not just say the words, but live the words to this holy prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven. My friends, let us stand in body or in spirit and let us sing together.
we go, let us take this text to heart. Let us be humble and consider others better than ourselves. But even as we do, let us remember that just like the prodigal son, God always loves us and our sonship can never be revoked. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also you. Please come and join us for coffee and goodies in the reception room. <laughs>